All right, so uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. I want to welcome you all to this iForce uh, Global Webinar. Uh, our topic today is the iForce Prize for OR in Development. So before we start, I just want to say a few words about iForce. Um, next slide. Uh, iForce is the International Federation of OR Societies, uh, where we have now more than 50 uh, members, which are the national societies, national OR societies. Uh, it was founded in 1959 by three OR societies, UK, USA, and France. Uh, and overall, we have in close to 30,000 individual members. Uh, at iForce, our aim is to advance the theory and practice of operations research all across the world. Uh, because we have now so many members, we are now divided into four regions, Euro, um, APORS, um, ALIO, and NORAM. Uh, okay, next. And we advance our goals through a number of activities, uh, including the conference, where the most recent one uh, have, was held in this past few months ago in Santiago. And uh, we also sponsor distinguished lecturers at each regional conference. We have uh, our journal Best Paper Award, and of course, this global webinar series. Uh, and we have newsletters and websites that we can communicate uh, with each other. And we also support summer and winter schools. So our main activities are publications, as I mentioned that there are uh, two journals. But um, so uh, IFOS is run by an administrative committee uh, where I'm the president and Fritz Prismar is the vice president and we have VPs representing each of the regions. Okay, sorry, next slide. <laughs> uh, so first I wanna remind uh, that uh, for two years, we have a conference uh, and the next one will be in 2026 in Vienna, Austria. Next slide. <laughs> so as I mentioned that we have uh, two uh, uh, flagship journals. One is the International Transactions in Operational Research and a new journal just started uh, Sustainability Analytics and Modeling. Next slide. <laughs> Um, we also have a quarterly newsletter that you can subscribe uh, via the iForce website. And this has information, has sections on tutorials and uh, information about all the workshops and conferences that goes on and other activities that goes on uh, in all our member societies all over the world. Next slide. Uh, okay, and one of course, uh, one of our main activities is, of course, this global webinar. So with that, I'll hand over to Vice President Fritz Bismarck, who will introduce. <laughs> Thank you very much, Yanni. Thank you. Um, yes, also from my side, dear participants, uh, welcome to this global webinar. Um, iForce regularly organizes these global webinars. You see them on this slide, and you can sort of look them back or look them for the first time um, at YouTube. Um, there is, um, IFRS has a prize for uh, OR in development. This webinar is devoted to that. The prize is handed out every three years under the leadership of a jury le led by uh, Mario Guajardo. Mario, thank you very much for this. Um, so I'm glad that uh, the winners that were announced in the uh, Santiago conference and the runner-up have agreed to uh, give their presentation in this global webinar. And um, you see their names coming up here and allow me to now introduce the runners up. Um, Daniela Parada and Rodrigo Castro from the University of Buenos Aires. They will give their uh, presentation that was titled Simulation and um, Analysis Tools to Support Real-Time Decision-Making for Argentina's COVID-19 Response. And with that, I'm going to give the floor to Rodrigo and or Daniela. Okay, thank you, Fritz. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure for us to be here today. I will start sharing my presentation. Hello, everyone. My name is Rodrigo Castro. As Fritz mentioned, um, and together with my several colleagues, I will present our work uh, for data science and simulation tools that we developed at public universities uh, in Argentina to support COVID-19 response decision-making. 
uh, on behalf of more than 30 collaborators from all over the country. For us, it's an honor to have participated in, in this prize and uh, to be here also today in this uh, webinar. Okay, so on March 3rd, 2020, the first case of COVID-19 was officially reported in Argentina. In the context of a developing economy, Argentina's infrastructure and institutions were not ready to deal with the crisis. The increasing inequality and poverty was reflected by 40% of the population living in an informal economy. There, the compliance with prolonged lockdowns could not be reasonably expected. In addition, Argentina's health decision-making system is federal. The 24 provinces have uh, policy-making autonomy, which makes centralized top-down decisions almost impossible. Also, there were no clear governance mechanisms to deal with issues such as privacy, access, and sharing of data. This created uh, some sort of confusion at the beginning between some areas of the administrations, the academia, and the private sector, making the processes somehow suboptimal. Okay, I just muted some noise that was coming. Okay, uh, so uh, with the closure of scientific and university life as we usually knew it, uh, we redirected every effort into applying our expertise in simulation, modeling, and analytics to assist decision makers in the fight against COVID-19. Though we were faced with a fundamental change in the traditional way of working with scientific modeling. The definition of the problem itself could mutate from one day to the next. New unforeseen questions were expected to arise overnight and answers were needed uh, with urgency and priorities would also change rapidly. In such a context, we started by focusing on developing tools to run what if and exercises. These would permit the estimation of plausible future scenarios under, under the assumption that different potential public policies were implemented. The problem at hand was strongly interdisciplinary, which naturally led us to expand the team beyond computer science and math, teaming up with biologists, sociologists, political scientists, physicians, just to name a few disciplines. At the outset, it was uh, uncertain exactly what kind of data would be needed and whether we would have access to it on a continuous basis. The data available on COVID-19 cases were not immediately ready to be shared openly, and their structure could also evolve dynamically. Then we set out to create a data lake to systematically store heterogeneous data that could come in different formats in, at different paces and from different sources, also perhaps sporadically. The arrival of COVID-19 occurred amidst a significant political polarization in Argentina. Adhering to personal hygiene recommendation or even mobility rest restrictions became associated with a political stances, either aligning or opposing the government. Hence the great importance of uh, uh, providing analysis from an independent uh, scientific community based on transparent analysis and offering uh, credible uh, answers to sensitive questions. Then we developed uh, a comprehensive web application that is uh, still online showing uh, up-to-date data about the uh, vaccination campaign um, to provide the public uh, with access to the results of the simulations and to the data panels that we also used uh, as source of curated evidence for fitting the mathematical simulation models. So this effort uh, required a high level of coordination and also creativity under high pressure to deliver results quickly. In such a complex context, 
we collaborated with uh, scientists and authorities from several places across the country, as we needed uh, varied and different perspectives. Th this is a list of uh, the districts and cities uh, with which we uh, interacted with their uh, administrations in several different ways. Okay, uh, this is the first of three short testimonials we want to share today with you. Um, this uh, first one is from the governor of the province of Buenos Aires, Dr. Axel Kicillof, which is the biggest uh, uh, conglomerate of population in Argentina, the biggest uh, province, um, who uh, comes from the academic world, but now is a main political figure in Argentina and played a, a very relevant role during the, the pandemic. Hola, mi nombre es Axel Kicillof, gobernador de la provincia de Buenos Aires, de Argentina. Eh, quería hoy compartir con ustedes algunas palabras sobre lo que fue aquí la lucha contra el COVID. Desde el comienzo de la pandemia, eh, convoqué y preparé un grupo interdisciplinario, científico, que colaboró en cada una de las instancias y en cada uno de los momentos en el en combate con la pandemia, con el COVID, y quería comentar específicamente el gran trabajo que ha hecho el Grupo de Simulación y Datos de la UBA, eh, que es el que desemboca en el trabajo que se está presentando. Es un trabajo que tiene que ver con el modo en que en los países en desarrollo hemos utilizado todas nuestras capacidades de conocimiento y de análisis para poder dar una respuesta más, más certera, científicamente fundada, y finalmente, en términos relativos, seguramente mucho más exitosa a, a, a la pandemia y al desafío que significó. Así que bueno, quería de nuevo lamentar no poder estar acompañándolos allí en Santiago, pero decirles que la aplicación que han, que han hecho a este respecto es de grandísima ayuda y que muchos de los que trabajaron dentro del grupo interdisciplinario, científico, aquí en la provincia de Buenos Aires, son hoy coautores del trabajo que se está presentando. Así que bueno, agradecerles a quienes hicieron el esfuerzo y a todos los que están escuchando por, por, por poder conocer y apreciar lo que la ciencia hace por el bienestar de nuestras sociedades. Hola. So, this was uh, the governor with whom we uh, interacted uh, very intensely during the the whole process uh, offering results and, and, and advices with the, the, the tools we have developed. So now uh, going to a, a different type of subject, uh, as it is well known in, in, in our community, models used in simulation, operations, research, analytics, they serve as tools to address clearly defined questions. Different questions may require different models, and often at different different spatial and temporal scales. Yet we faced um, uh, an, an, an unknown phenomenon. It was obvious that the questions would change, and the the, the models needed also change. Thus, we approached the problem by creating an ecosystem of models that could be used in different ways throughout the crisis. We then developed a variety of compartmental seed models with we, which we adapted to different characteristics of geographical distribution, uh, delays in data reporting and the lockdown mechanisms, and so on. This led us to adopt techniques such as differential equations, optimization, difference equations with explicit delays, agent-based models, graph-based models, and regression models. So it was an, an, an ecosystem, a toolkit of different models. So for instance, we have the typical uh, continuous time difference, uh, differential equations, also the discrete time equations that are more suitable for representing uh, delays in, in, in data, data communication, uh, agent-based models to study the mobility in uh, very specific uh, cities of, of the country. We also created uh, geo-referenced metapopulation level models. Uh, you see here uh, clusters of different populations and how 
this uh, the, the intensity of the color, the notes, the the the, the curve, the, the intensity, the level of, of the curve of, curve of contagions, and this is automatically created by composing uh, a network of several uh, steered models with some uh, intercluster at JCC matrix. Uh, this was applied for the greater Buenos Aires area. Also, agent-based models at indoor level. Uh, these are multi-scale uh, models because we have here agents that are crossing from uh, one room to the other and the rooms uh, accumulate uh, infected uh, aerosols that could uh, in, infect other agents coming uh, later uh, once the, in, the original infected agent left the room already. Uh, this is a, a aerosol mediated uh, contagion. But all of this is also um, modulated by um, the, the, the administration, the state that is uh, enforcing some contact tracing mechanism. So if you get a call because you are close contact of someone that reported an infection, then uh, this model captures that and take you out of the system. So th this was a, a multi-level type of, of, uh, of model, no, agent-based model. Uh, we also have uh, fitted um, dynamics seed models to data. The, this is the, the data coming from the 532 districts in, in, in Argentina, and we fitted the, the models and uh, identified the reproductive uh, characteristic parameter uh, of the pandemic across the different uh, epochs of, of the evolution of, of the curve. And that allowed us to make some projections, uh, short-term projections of, um, of the potential evolution of, of the curve given that everything was um, remained the same, right? That, that there were no uh, uh, discrete uh, disruptive events, of course. So um, and this was, uh, this is, is still running uh, online. This uh, every 24 hours, it, um, uh, it, it runs an optimization, uh, fitting, uh, minimizing the errors between the model and, and the data. Okay, so um, now another central contribution in, in our opinion was that of the selective plant and intermittent isolations or SPIL for short, this is the acronym um, that we developed. Um, this is um, an, an alternative for the official lockdown that was called, uh, this is an acronym in, in Spanish, uh, ASPO. ASPO was the name of the official lockdown and our counter proposal was SPIL. Uh, the ASPO, the official um, strategy consisted of a recurrently prolonged and degraded nationwide lockdown. So our proposal uh, differs essentially in four aspects. Regarding the decisions on lockdown uh, periods, the, the starting, the renewing, or the ending of, of, of the lockdown periods. The official approach, it was made as reactions uh, to the fluctuations of the contagion curve, one measure at a time uh, according to, to what we see in the curve. In our proposal, it was anticipated as, as a sequence of closing and opening cycles in a pre-designed calendar. Uh, regarding the duration of periods, uh, the official approach, the duration was unknown because it was subject to change uh, depending on the contagion curve. In our proposal, it, it was uh, the, the periods would last until a clear and predefined and verifiable goal, goal was met. Regarding the communication of changes um, in the official approach, it was only a few hours prior to the expiration or start of each new measure. In our proposal, it was anticipated by uh, several cycles, several weeks. And most importantly, uh, the effects of, of all of this in the society. Uh, the official strategy in the end showed to bring more uncertainty, skepticism, tension and polarization, and uh, importantly, lack of commitment. If you don't have people with a commitment to, 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 the, to the measures, then the, 
management of, of the process is very complicated. What we offered was a greater certainty, more social and economic order because of the anticipation of, of, of the measures uh, and more consensus and commitment. Th this uh, is uh, what we, this is our diagnosis and this is our uh, proposal that we implemented in our um, simulation models. So, um, <clears throat> We developed multiple uh, simulation exercises considering the effects of applying cycles of closures and openings uh, at different times of the pandemic. Uh, the results uh, showed the consequences in terms of the potential number of lives uh, saved that were in, in the range of hundreds to thousands. Uh, here we, we have a, an example of data, the model fit in the data, and then a what if exercise uh, if this strategy was applied uh, with some um, reproduction number of characteristics of what we have seen already in Argentina for uh, periods of, uh, of social mobility and for periods of uh, lockdown. Um, so the, the name is uh, spill is for selective because it can be applied by geographic area and by economic activity it's not uh, flat and, and the same for everyone it is planned because it is designed in advance and it's predictable uh, as opposed to reacting to what we see in the curve we have the model we can uh, know more we can do more than just looking at the uh, instant um, snapshot of the curve, which is a, a representation of a, a consequence of the dynamics that have been de developing uh, some weeks ago. And it is, of course, intermittent because we have this uh, of this cycle of opening and closing. And this in, in the models show to bring the curve down in, in a compatible, compatible way with the um, economic activity because you have open side. Okay, um, um, now this is um, a, a, a snapshot of uh, some uh, statements made by the nation's health minister that uh, towards the end of 2020 began to comment publicly on the desirability of intermittent uh, lockdown. Already in 2021, we offered the nation's presidency a set of analysis based on the intermittent lockdowns strategy, considering different levels of obedience to the measures. For instance, here we have three scenarios. If we applied the, the strategy here, uh, if we had 15%, uh, 30%, or 45% of mobility reduction, just to, to, to show uh, to show an, an example. Okay, several of the models and analysis that we developed for these projects are now part of uh, leading national and international scientific publications and books. These are some of, of these, and uh, there are some others coming up. And also, over the course of two years, we have given dozens of interviews, meetings, and briefings uh, on the models and the scenario projections. We have uh, advised uh, government officials, unions, health center directors, and human rights or organizations. And this included the Presidential Advisory Committee of Experts for COVID-19, the mothers of Plaza de Mayo and the Nobel Peace Prize winner Adolfo Perez Esquivel, uh, these uh, social organizations that were trying to help in, in very different ways uh, to face this, uh, this pandemic. Um, specifically in Rosario City, which is the third largest urban center in the country, the city council approved in June 2021 uh, a proposal for the implementation of the intermittent lockdown project for the city and the surrounding suburbs. 
Now, uh, this is the second uh, testimonial. This is uh, Nora Barr, uh, who is the uh, national reference in scientific journalism in Argentina, with whom we have been uh, interacting heavily to bring uh, a be better, better type of communication to, to the population based on uh, that data analytics. Soy Nora Barr y soy periodista científica desde hace alrededor de 40 años. Durante todo ese tiempo no puedo recordar un solo momento más desafiante, más exigente que la reciente pandemia. Nos vimos obligados a reportar en medio de un mar de noticias falsas e incertidumbres y la información que entregábamos podía significar la diferencia entre la vida y la muerte. El trabajo del grupo de simulación y análisis de datos de la Facultad de Ciencias Exactas de la Universidad de Buenos Aires cuyos integrantes no solo eran matemáticos, sino también sociólogos y biólogos, resultó absolutamente fundamental para entender y transmitir las noticias a nuestro público. Es difícil en este momento exagerar el valor de sus aportes, especialmente la interpretación de la información numérica que llegaba de todo el mundo y también de los estudios y análisis realizados por las autoridades sanitarias de nuestro país los resultados de los programas de vacunación temprana y los diferentes escenarios socioeconómicos y biológicos del momento y del futuro, de lo que vendría después, que podíamos esperar. Personalmente, creo que una contribución clave fue el desarrollo de una herramienta innovadora que tuvo en cuenta las necesidades culturales, económicas e institucionales específicas de la Argentina. Los cierres intermitentes, planificados, selectivos, una estrategia que no se había utilizado en otros países. Además, todos los integrantes de este grupo estuvieron siempre disponibles para nosotros, 24 horas por día, los 7 días de la semana. Solo puedo decir muchas, muchas, muchas gracias por su trabajo. Ok, thanks, Nora. And so now uh, I will give the floor to my colleague, uh, Daniela Parada, who will present uh, a specific aspect of uh, data analysis in, in our project. So, Daniela. Thanks, Rodrigo. Uh, yes, in fact, uh, COVID-19 vaccination campaign was launched in Argentina in late December 2020. So in that time, the vaccines available were administered to the population in several different schemes. Uh, this observational study presents a quantification of the impact of the probability of death of those different schemes for confirmed COVID-19 uh, cases in Argentina's Buenos Aires province. Next, please, Rodrigo. So we decided to limit our analysis to first confirmations only, which adds up to 1.4 million records. Each record here indicate the individual's symptom onset date, the vaccine type received, the dates and numbers of doses administered, and um, each individual city of residence, and the date of the death if the individual actually died. In assigning cases to the categories, a person was considered to have received one dose if at least 14 days passed between receiving that dose and the symptom onset date. The metrics for vaccine impact that we use in the study were the probability of death reduction rate and the effectiveness calculated and estimated both using two different modeling strategies. Next, please, Rodrigo. So to quantify the effectiveness of this vaccination program, uh, we define two categorical variables. The first that we denoted vaccination state classifies individuals into three categories, unvaccinated, one dose, and two or more doses. The second one, the noted vaccine group, defines cases by the combination of vaccine types, uh, Sputnik, Sinopharm, or, or Covishield. Probability of death was then formulated as a generalized linear model with a logistic link. This model include uh, the vaccination status variables as well as age, sex, and city of residence. It also includes the uncovered basic, basic needs index uh, by city, which is a kind of uh, index to, to measure socioeconomic situation on the city of residence and the time of the year at symptom onset. 
An example of these results is the case on, uh, of an average 80 year man that, uh, whose probability of death was 44% if unvaccinated, but dropped to 19% with two doses. According to the vaccine group analysis, the study's results showed that the most effective vaccine was Sputnik, followed by Covishield and then Sinopharm. Next, please, Rodrigo. The other modeling strategy that we use is based on Cox proportional hazards model of time to death. This model estimated the risk of death as a function of elapsed time mm -hmm. in days from symptom onset. Interesting findings were revealed by the variables for infected person city of residence and the time of the year of symptom onset. Uh, city socioeconomic level, this basic uncovered basic needs index that I said, uh, proved to be a good predictor of death probability, which was slightly higher in cities with poorer populations. Also, death probability was found to rise in the winter season as expected. Next, please, Rodrigo. So some key findings of this study, this observational study, uh, for the logistic model, well, we found that uh, we had a rapid growth of probability of death with age, greater probability of death levels for men, and a strong effect for vaccination. Also, this probability declined rapidly and drastically with second dose. Um, the study's results show that the most effective vaccine was a Sputnik, followed by Covishield and then Sinopharm, in the categories that we study. And well, effectiveness levels range from 50% to 90% for two or more doses. And we also calculated the additional number and proportion of death that would be expected if all individuals in our database were unvaccinated. So the value obtained for expected additional death was 7,610 or an excess of a little bit more than 25% over the number of deaths that we actually observed in our database. Please, Rodrigo. Okay, thank you, Daniela, for your presentation. Uh, I'm now coming to the finalization of our presentation. I will share our last testimonial. Dr. Omar Suet is a medical infectious disease doctor, and he was the member of the presidential committee of COVID-19, uh, advising the, the president for manage, managing the the pandemic, and he was a key actor in um, channelizing our uh, the results and our proposals. Cuando los primeros casos de SARS-CoV-2 aparecieron, yo estaba como presidente de la Sociedad Argentina de Infectología, y por eso me tocó estar muy involucrado en investigar qué es lo que estaba pasando, recolectar información y también comunicarla, transmitirla a la población general de una forma que la puedan entender y que la gente pueda tomar algunas medidas de prevención. Tuve el honor también de ser parte del comité presidencial del COVID-19 y ahí tuvimos mucho contacto con muchos grupos interdisciplinarios para intentar entender las políticas de salud que podríamos estar eh, apoyando o asesorando a fin de reducir el impacto de, de la infección en toda la comunidad. Y ahí quiero destacar entonces el trabajo del grupo de simulación y análisis de datos de la Facultad de Ciencias Exactas de la Universidad de Buenos Aires. Con ellos estuvimos analizando muchos datos a través del modelaje eh, matemático y fue muy interesante ver la posibilidad del de, modelo ASPI, esta posibilidad de tener fases cortas de, o intermitentes de cierre y de apertura para maximizar eh, los beneficios en la reducción de la transmisión y reducir al máximo también el impacto económico. Creo que esto eh, demuestra la importancia que tiene incorporar expertos de modelado matemático en el análisis de cualquiera de las nuevas pandemias que estemos viendo en el futuro a fin de tomar las mejores decisiones. Muchísimas gracias. Ok, thank you, Omar. Now, the conclusions and outlook. Uh, we have faced a, a problem that was a challenge, of course, uh, to define to define clearly, uh, and, and this uh, was difficult to to define specifically what we needed to do and when, uh, prompting us to seek creative combinations of modeling, simulation, and optimization techniques. Our approach was proved relevant and impactful to the public, to the media, and the, to the policymakers, and through a broad network of collaborators, 
uh, across the country, we created a new platform for real-time and data analysis that is tightly coupled with simulation models to produce what-if scenarios. Uh, this, uh, we think, has taken the state's decision-making capabilities to a new level to cope, to cope with future pandemics and local uh, epidemics other than COVID-19. Uh, finally, uh, I want to congratulate our colleagues uh, from the other uh, groups that were finalists in the competition. We had a real, really good time in, in, in Chile and uh, there were all uh, excellent presentations and it, it was a pleasure uh, for us to to share this competition with, with them uh, in particular of course we uh, congratulate the first place winners uh, that uh, will give a talk after us and um, uh, finally we would like to thank everyone who helped in the fight against COVID-19 in Argentina most especially to our families for without their tireless support during hundreds and hundreds of hours, uh, this project would not have been possible. And we want to dedicate the prize to our fellow citizens and families that have suffered or lost their lives and even continue to struggle today with the long-term consequences of this uh, devastating pandemic, uh, especially in our context of uh, social inequality and pressing poverty. Uh, we consider that if we have in any way influenced some decisions that prevented uh, even uh, few avoidable death, uh, then we will have uh, accomplished our scientific mission. So thank you very much. And we are open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniela, Rodrigo. Thank you very much for this very, very nice and uh, informative presentation. And it is uh, impressive to see the uh, the impact, uh, the impact that you generated. And also in the chat, I saw uh, something like there's a lot to take in. So um, that's nice. Let me go to the Q&A and see uh, whether there are questions for you. I see a question by Gerhard Willem Weber, allow me to sort of phrase that question to you. Thanks for the talk. Could, according to your opinion, in future uncertainty elements be helpful while not increasing complexity too much? Uh, an example could be regime switching models. Um, is that, uh, can you sort of comment on that question? Okay, so I, I understand that the question is regarding how, how to deal with complexity and uncertainty. Yes, yeah, so, in, so in yeah. these kind of, uh, of scenarios that are by definition extremely uncertain. Okay, um, I, I don't see any other solution than uh, having uh, a set, a toolkit of, of different models with each model has its pros and cons and each model uh, uh, captures complexity in different ways and makes some assumptions and is more detailed in some other aspects. So uh, as soon as you have a, a model hitting some limits, uh, for instance, a SEER model, uh, compartmental models uh, with differential equations, they assume his, uh, homogeneous mix, right? So then for some questions, these model, models are good enough. For some other questions, more uh, micro scale, uh, they are not good at all. Uh, they don't capture heterogeneity. So um, because complexity is complex, let me say, then you you cannot um, you, you cannot know it. Uh, if you knew it, it's not complex anymore. So uh, then having different models running in parallel with cross consistency check. The parameters you, you use for one model are consistent with the parameters you use for other models. And then you run what if scenarios. You run some um, uh, sensitivity analysis, right? First to check for robustness, and then you um, tweak parameters in order, in order to uh, um, practice with a uh, um, optimistic and pessimistic or, or average conditions of, of what you expect it, it could come. So then you have a, a broader view, but 
that's uh, from my perspective is the the most we can do with with mathematical tools we, we know we have yeah. okay i understand i'm going to look at the second question that is in the in the q a it's a question from martin eras green from fiuba he's saying thank you so much for the great presentation also a help for us argentinias my question is is there any plan on partially open sourcing the models for instance on github our models uh, are not currently on any open repository because we are like um, beautifying or fixing or um, ma making it more uh, openly accessible because uh, as, as i said we have developed a uh, on rush <laughs> so uh, we we think that if we want to open the, the models uh, they need to be more well organized for being presented to, to the public and we are uh, currently uh, in, in in the middle of that process okay i'm going to uh go to the final question uh, i'm just going to read it out aloud is Rodrigo now nearly as famous as Lionel Messi in Argentina? <laughs> that seems a hard question to answer, but <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, I refrain myself um, from putting the last slide when where we had our uh, our team, our soccer team, celebrating. Um, I think that uh, Messi and um, all of the, the the players in our great team uh, had to do with with COVID in in a very important way, which is that they have brought some happiness to to our to our people to our country after having after having suffered uh, such a terrible couple of years. And um, yes, we, we we can easily dedicate this uh, to Messi and, and all the guys as well. That's a very good answer. So thank you very much once again, Daniela, Rodrigo. We much appreciate your presentation here. Thank you very much. Um, so I much. Um, propose to move on to the second presentation, which will be given by Kuo Hao Chang. Uh, once again, uh, my um, uh, fellow semi congratulations for uh, winning the uh, iForce Prize. And uh, uh, you're going to talk about safer homeland, developing evacuation and simulation and humanitarian relief logistics models. And the title is even a bit longer, perhaps. Uh, Kwa, Kwa, Kwa. Hello. Um, uh, everybody can hear me, right? I can hear Hello. you. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, so can I start right now? Yep. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And also thanks to uh, Dr. Castro's presentation. And thanks to the panel, you know, the committee who uh, chosen, who have chosen as the winner. So we are, we were really, really surprised and very honored. So today I'm going to share again uh, our research, our projects uh, called Safer Homeland uh, Developing Evacuation Simulation and Humanitarian Relief Logistics Models for Effective Disaster Preparation and Response in Taiwan. You can go to full screen mode if you want. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, uh, okay, let, let, me, let me try. Uh, okay, okay. Is that okay? That is full screen, right? Yeah, okay, all right. So uh, before uh, I get started, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm now a professor at National Tsinghua University. I'm also the deputy director of uh, National Science and Technology Center for Disaster Reduction. Uh, I was hired in 2020 uh, to serve as the deputy director because the government would like to apply the uh, so-called big data analytics or operation research, whatever you call it, <laughs> to help the government to do the disaster uh, reduction work. So uh, uh, back then, I started to uh, look at the disaster operations problems and try to apply the operation research techniques to, to provide the government more information and help the government 
to do better decision making, uh, you know, a lot of things. So I'm very honored that um, uh, I was given this opportunity to apply OR and uh, even more honored to share uh, my research uh, with uh, these institutions. In brief, I call it NCDR. So today I'm going to talk about uh, basically two research streams. And actually that is, that is among many. Uh, we have done some research uh, quite a lot, but I, put, I just you know chose to uh, to present today. So one is about the simulation model, and the other is about the humanitarian relief logistics. So as as I think uh, some of you may have known that Taiwan is actually located in the Pacific of fire. So which means that Taiwan uh, suffer you know a, a lot of earthquake happened in Taiwan. And so that's why the Taiwan is very vulnerable to the destructive impact of many uh, major earthquakes. Uh, if you see the pictures uh, down here, you can see the left hand side is the earthquake happened in 1999. This is called GG earthquake. And that earthquake uh, caused more than 2,500 deaths. And the right hand side, you know, if you look at this picture, either space that, um, Sometimes when earthquake or some major disasters happens, uh, there are a lot of relief goods that need to be delivered to people in need. However, the, the logistics, you know, there are some issues, some problems with the logistics. So sometimes some, some regions are uh, oversupplied, some regions are undersupplied. So obviously there is a humanitarian logistic uh, problem to be solved. So we, we want to make sure that when disaster happen, uh, especially in particular, an earthquake. When earthquake happens, we have to make sure that the commodities can be sent to the people uh, who, who need them. Okay, so so these two pictures actually motivate uh, me and my team. Oh, by the way, I forget to mention. So this is uh, all the research I presented today. It is a, a collaborative work with my grad student and my department. Okay, so the first research stream is about an evacuation simulation model, uh, but uh, I'm going to leave the technical details in the paper we published in the past, but I'm going to present mainly focus on the models and the uh, uh, managerial insights and what we can learn out of the simulation model. So basically we are uh, looking at a very large scale uh, pedestrian evacuation situation. And because, you know, uh, I don't know if you know this or not, actually in, in Taipei, uh, we have like uh, more than 70% buildings are older than, uh, you know, 30 years. <laughs> so that's very old buildings. And so the government is very concerned, you know, when the, some major, you know, earthquake uh, occurs. And so we may need to do a lot of, you know, a large scale evacuation. So that's why we want to uh, understand, you know, more about the evacuation situation. So the, the reason we build this model is to strengthen our understanding for the post-disaster evacuation process. And we want, to, we want to evaluate how effective and efficient um, that the current government protocol is. And also we want to have more valuable insights so we, probably we can improve the protocol. And uh, ultimately, we want to optimize the evacuation strategies. I'm going to present that very soon. So basically, uh, this simulation framework we propose uh, have uh, several models, including the cell-based road network model and also agent-based uh, evacuation model. So we are talking about uh, agent-based evacuation. So basically, each evacuee is considered an agent, an autonomous agent. So he or she can choose the path uh, you know, they want to go. So actually this uh, framework has several components, including the pre-processing component. And uh, also we call in intracellular flow component because we basically we divide all the traffic uh, network into several, uh, into a lot of uh, cells. I'm gonna present that very soon. And also the intercellular flow component and the population update component, but these are the very technical. So uh, let, let me show you, use some pictures to show you the idea. So if I use the Dan district as an example, why I use the Dan district? Because it is a 
district uh, with the population more than 300,000 uh, residents. So, so we are thinking about a scenario when earthquake happens, how can we evacuate? evacuate all the residents living in Da'an district. So basically we divide the Da'an district into more than 4,000 cells. And then based on the Terria, so Terria is actually a, a platform uh, developed by NCDR. So they use all the you know, technique in civil engineering and a lot of uh, different disciplines, techniques in different disciplines to estimate each row, you know, the probability, how fragile, how, how fragile each row is. So you can see here, so this is a probability that uh, the, the, the row is gonna sustain the, the earthquake. So you can see that we can estimate, uh, so this, this, uh, this green down line represent the, the row that is slight, that will be slightly damaged and this line, represent the moderate, you know, uh, damage. And this row, this row, this slide represented, that would be completely or extensively damaged. So we can estimate uh, based on real data, you know, the fragility of each row. And then we can generate based on the scenario. For example, if we are talking about the magnitude 6.5 earthquake, then we can generate the, the, the one scenario that if you can, if you look at this picture, the darker, there's also all of this, uh, the line represent the rules. So if, so the darker the rule is, that means the, the, the degree of undamaged degree of the rule. So we can generate the, based on the scenario, earthquake magnitude scenario, we generate the rule. And we understand that uh, how damaged each rule is. Is it undamaged or slightly damaged or moderate damage? Okay, and then we generate autonomous agent. So each agent they can, you know, uh, choose to to go to the nearest uh, shelter or the second nearest shelters, and they can have different probabilities depends on the the travel time they choose uh, where to go. Okay, and 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 through through which which sales. So so, so so there are a lot of things they can they they can. Uh, they can be decided autonomously. So this is the result of the simulation model. Uh, so this is after one second, after 60 seconds, up to after uh, 3,600 seconds. And you look, if you look at this picture, all the dark line, uh, the, the, the blue line here is, represent the, the flow of the population or evacuees. So you can see that when time passes by, uh, all the most of the evacuees will uh, go to the shelters they 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 choose, and if you look at this uh, after thirty six hundred seconds, so the the here you see the the green a very big green uh, circle here, right? So the green the color green represent that these uh, shelters still have the capacity more than fifty percent, so we can still. Uh, you know, uh, help more evacuees in here. But here, the, the red dot here represents that basically the capacity has reached to at least 80%. So that means it's almost full or very close to two to four degree. And also you can see all the, the blue line has disappeared because all the, the uh, evacuee flow has uh, gone to the, the places they should go to. And also based on the simulation model, we want to understand more about the, as I just mentioned, more about the evacuation process because in Taiwan, uh, each building has been designated uh, one shelter center to go to. So we would like, we would like to understand uh, how the compliance rate uh, affect the evacuation process. When I say compliance rate, that I mean that all the residents, all the evacuees uh, comply with the government's uh, uh, guidance so, so for example, if you are, uh, you know, given the information that you should go to this shelter, but when the evacuation uh, really take place, did, did you really go to that the, the shelter? And how would that affect the evacuation process? So, you, and very interesting, you can see that when the evac uh, the compliance rate goes uh, is increasing, actually the evacuation time, the total evacuation time actually increased, and that that is very interesting because. 
we, we think that everybody should follow the government's gu guidance, right? But why the, the evacuation process takes even more time when the when people comply with uh, government's uh, uh, guidance, and then we look into detail. So we divided, uh, you know, so we would look at the, all the boroughs, you know, in the Dan district. And then we realized that this is because, you know, if we don't have enough shelter centers, and even, even you know, you know, you should go to this uh, uh, shelter center, but, but maybe, you know, when this earthquake have, uh, you know, occurs, and the government did not really open this shelter center. So you have no choice but go to the second uh, nearest shelter center. So that could, you know, significantly increase the, the time it takes to, to find a place. So, and on average, that could actually increase the, the average evacuation time. So that leads to the, the second issue, how many shelter centers we should open when earthquake happens. So that leads us to the, the, the second uh, research problems. So we develop a very quick heuristic uh, based on the, the, the distance between the shelter, each shelter and the, uh, each evacuation center. So, so we actually we we, we kind of look at the 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 the, the cell, and we use the center of the cell uh, as one as one point, and the evacuation center as another. Uh, the shelter center is another point, and we 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 calculate the distance, and then we 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 use the distance to to rank all the shelters, okay, and then we 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 rank we we. And then if you look at the, the right hand side, the picture here. So we look at this picture and we've realized that. So, so these pictures, uh, the Da and Forest Park, this is the uh, rank the first and, uh, and, and the second, the third. And we realized that the, the evacuation actually decreased when we uh, opened the Ren Ai Junior High School and then tapers off, this curve kind of tapers off. So we we want we use that as a very quick heuristic for the government to decide, you know, uh, how many shelters that uh, we should open and which one we should open. Okay, so but but map, but obviously this is not the optimal solution. This is some quick risk, uh, heuristic for the government to make a decision, right? So the subse subsequently we 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 do some research about. Uh, you know how to optimize the the number of shelters to to be open and which which one should be open. So we mathematically formulate the problem. So the first first day decision uh, is that we choose which one we should open. Uh, yeah, which shelter we should open. And the second decision is to, is an allocation problem. So which evacuees should be assigned to which uh, shelter center, and then. Because in the at NCDR we have a division called socioeconomics division. They can estimate and evaluate the deprivation cost of each uh, a region. So if you look at this uh, picture on here, let me quickly show you that. So so here the 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 red region that represents the the district that is at high risk, which means that the deprivation cost is relatively high, and the the green region here represent it is very low risk which means the deprivation cost is relatively low. So, and this is our data we collected, you know, based on the, the socioeconomics division uh, provided us. And so we are, we are able to uh, model the problem. So we, we formulate, as a, formulate as a two stage stochastic optimization model. So we decide on, you know, uh, which shelter should be open and, uh, and how many, so these are the, the technical details. I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, skip all of them. And then we develop some solution method to quickly solve the problem. So I want to share some insight we uh, derive or we gain from this uh, model. So the first insight we learn out of this model is that the neighborhood is located on the outskirts of Dan district have higher average deprivation cost per EBQE because that is very because that uh, neighborhood is very far away from the nearest evacuation center. So the deprivation cost is very high. And then we understand that it is very helpful that if we can allocate more and new shelters to boroughs with high costs, or social with 
uh, exceeding shelter capacities. So some, some shelter center, they are very easy to reach the capacity. So we believe that we should allocate, uh, you know, uh, suggest that the government should allocate uh, more and the new shelters to the borough. And also we found that the optimization model provides very good insights into the optimal number opening shelters uh, with different scenarios, with different magnitude, uh, earthquake magnitudes. And uh, we learn the priorities of the rural refurbishment uh, projects because you know sometimes some some uh, regions, some boroughs are very densely populated. So we are able to prioritize the rural refurbish, uh, refurbishment projects. And also finally, we believe that the current government protocol has something to be uh, improved because uh, based on this uh, simulation model, a lot of current practice, a lot of current protocols are not uh, optimal. So a lot of strategies can be uh, further optimized, okay. And this is the real-time decision support system. We integrate all the models and solution methods. So you can see that if the government, uh, the decision makers, uh, you know, uh, input some parameters are required by the model and they can get the results. They can estimate how much time it takes to evacuate all the district and what is the maximum evacuation time and a lot of things that can be, you know, uh, gained out of this simulation model. Okay, so this is the first research stream. And the second research stream, I would like to talk about the post-disaster humanitarian relief logistics. So basically after a major earthquake, usually there is a spike in demand for relief. Good. For example, like water, food, medical supplies, or the survival equipment, a lot of things, right? But the, the challenge is in the uncertainties because Number one, the demand is uncertain, right? Because we don't know, you know, uh, how much is needed for the, the relief goods. And also the damage and destruction of the roads, bridges, buildings, and other things, you know, the disruption are uncertain. We, we have no idea, right? And also the traffic flow conditions, okay? So we would like to build a relief logistic distribution model to account for these uncertainties. And our goal is to, to minimize the expected completion time of operation. And we again, we want to compare our approach uh, with the current uh, government protocol. And the two major topics were examined. The first, we want to understand how the optimal decisions, for example, uh, the first stage we are talking about the distribution center location. And the second decision is about the vehicle sizing and the routing and how these optimal decisions varies with the earthquake magnitude. Okay, so, I mean, is, if the magnitude, the earthquake, you know, magnitude increases, how should we update and change the decision? And the second topic is also of interest is how to, how do the optimal decision and the corresponding estimated total cost vary with the logistic parameters? So for example, if some, uh, you know, some, some traffic condition has changed, how should we rearrange the, the logistic to, uh, to deliver the commodities to the people in need? So we are looking at, we used uh, one, we used two examples. Uh, one is called small network. This is based on the data industry, just like the previous uh, research stream. And the other is the large network. This is based on the, uh, Da'an district and the Zhongshan district and the Zhongzhen district. And we want to, because we are talking about the vehicle routing problems, right? So we want to estimate, it depends on the S, S means the scenario, earthquake scenario, but based on different earthquake scenario, we want to estimate the traffic jam density. So uh, we model the traffic jam uh, density and then in phase one, we generate the raw network. So we consider the k shortest path so so for example each row we give the the, the so you if you look at the you know uh here down, down here you can see the the row if the width is greater than 15 meters we give the weight one and if it is less than eight meters we give it the weight 10. 
because we want to make sure that the, lo the logistic can take advantage of the the rule with uh you know uh, wider is uh, take advantage of wider rules. So we generate 50 uh, short hit pads and uh, 10 short hit pads with different ways, and we compare the results. And you can see here, so the first stage is about the distribution center location. And the second uh, stage is about the vehicle sizing and the, you know, the routing uh, decisions. Uh, so we generate different uh, rules, scenarios. And we build a mathematical model to, to account for the, all the uncertainty. So you can see here, I use expectation because there is a lot of uncertainty involved in the process. So I'm going to skip the mathematic, mathematical model here, but I just want to emphasize that model one represents the model we propose. And the, the model two is the current distribution model based on the, the current government protocol. And of course, there are a lot of uh, uncertainties involved. So it takes a lot of time to, to solve the, the opti for the optimal solution. So we apply the idea called sample average approximation and uh, estimate the gap of the uh, optimal solution to the estimate, the truly optimal solution to the estimated optimal solution. And it iteratively you know, converts to the optimal solution. But I'm going to skip the technical details. I just want to emphasize the, the results. So you can see here, so this is model one, the blue line is the model one, the pink one, uh, pink line is the model two. That is the cur current uh, government's protocol. So you can see that based on the model we propose, actually we can greatly or at least significantly, you know, reduce the response time. Okay, at least 10 to 15 percent. Okay. This is for the small network. For large network that the, the reduced amount of time is even uh, larger. And then we want to compare, you know, what happens when the magnitude varies. So you can see that from 5.5 to 7.0, the estimate uh, estimated color cost increased, but the the critical dis distribution center is always 2793. And the vehicle side decision, uh, only when the magnitude is 7.0, we need one more uh, vehicle. And if we set the time limit, if we look at the model from a different perspective, we, we set a time limit, we say, oh, okay, we want to make sure the all the log logistic has been uh, completed within uh, 6,000 seconds. And then what, sh how, you know, what, what should the critical, uh, what, what should the distribution center be located and uh, how, what is the vehicle size and uh, you know, the routing. And you can see that uh, if we set the limit to 600 and uh, the, we need you know, 14 uh, vehicles, but if we allow more uh, you know, completion time, and then we, 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 we can you know, reduce the, the, the number of vehicles required. But interestingly, you can see that all the critical you know, distribution center is 2793. And why is that? So we look at the detail and we, we found that because the distribution center 2793, uh, why it is always important or critical is because all the rules around the, this distribution center is relatively less damaged regardless of what scenario the earthquake is. Okay, so, so that's why it is very important that 2793 is always assigned, you know, as a critical distribution center. So the vehicles depart from or return to this distribution center, you know, have lower chance of encountering, uh, you know, traffic flow speed or traffic jams. And uh, also based on the analysis, we found that additional vehicle is needed when the magnitude, the earthquake magnitude rises to 7.0. And the many vehicles are needed to dispatch from distribution center 2793 in order to avoid exorbitant deprivation costs at many of the less center located uh, relief centers when the time limit was set very low, like 600. And we also, you know, in, integrate all the models and the solution method into uh, this system called, uh, in Taiwan, we call it Comprehensive Disaster Decision Support System. So with this system, currently this system has been used for the, uh, like the, the drill. So uh, as I just mentioned, the earthquake, you know, the major earthquake like caused more than 2,500 deaths 
happened in 1999, September 21st. So in every year, September 21st, this is you know, uh, chosen as the National uh, Disaster Prevention Day. So we always you know, uh, practice you know, how to evacuate, how to uh, you know, prevent, prevent damage from the earthquake. So here, the comprehensive decision support system, disaster decision support system has been used that allow the decision maker to decide how many shelters to be open and uh, the vehicle routing and a lot of you know decisions and they they currently they they use that as uh, for the you know uh, practice purposes. Okay, the conclusions. So I, I think the disaster operation management is a very important area. Uh, to be honest, I have. I have not involved in this area before, but I figure that this is very important area that, that can uh, greatly uh, benefit from the OR technique. And I personally also believe that the impact of OR can be increased uh, greatly when combined with very impactful domains like the disaster operations management, because everybody cares about that, right? And also, but there are some challenges uh, for example, uh, I also have some challenge, uh, encounter some challenge when I communicate with some domain experts, like a civil engineer, seismologists or meteorologists, etc. So we didn't speak the same language. So I spent a lot of time, you know, communicating with them to build the model and make sure the solution method makes sense and the revise the model, a lot of things. But I think that, that, that that's worth the, the efforts. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for listening. 